This is Dr. Baba Kazizade. You are listening to the Smile Podcast, where I will be sharing with you my unique and holistic perspective on beauty, health, and wellness. Hello. <laughs> Millions of people have surgery every year. Or you could just get a boob job. Using targeted Botox can be a miracle. Smiling like that is a skill. Your surgery has been successful. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Smile Podcast. I'm Dr. Aziza Day, and today I have a very, very special guest, a really great friend of mine, and one of the world's best dermatologists and most well known and talented dermatologists that you will ever see, Dr. Rebecca Fitzgerald. And uh, it's so great having you, Becky. And I'm going to call her Becky, but it's Dr. Fitzgerald. It's great so, to be here, Bobby. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Fitzgerald um, uh, has a, a private practice in uh, Los Angeles, and we've known each other for a while. And uh, I, 15 we, years, yeah, maybe? we met through a mutual friend, and Dr. Fitzgerald was actually setting up her practice. That's right. That's and right. I was maybe a couple of years into my practice and uh, we, I, I feel like we connected like, like immediately. right away, immediately. That's such a nice thing. Isn't immediately. It? And uh, not only is Dr. Fitzgerald just an amazing, amazing uh, dermatologist, she's just one of the kindest uh, human beings you, you'll ever meet. So it's really, really good having you here and uh, um, being our guest today. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm very excited about this project. The um, It's a really great way to communicate to a really wide audience and get a lot of information out there. And the um, and you're really great with people. So <laughs> I think it's going to be a lot of fun to watch watch all of it. So yeah, thanks for it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. We were talking before we started why, uh, you know, uh, I started this podcast and kind of the whole... Uh, whole process so it is it is kind of cool and I think um, you know we want to kind of get into details that you know usually segments on TV shows or little segments you know in on the internet just don't give the amount of details and this is you know I think a good you know format avenue to and it. format yeah. to be able to yeah. talk about beauty health wellness just kind of and they all go hand in hand as yeah. as we always talk about you know yeah. people come in for beauty but they're really seeking something else right yes yes so, that's very true so today this today's um uh, podcast will be really focused on something that many people go to see dermatologists and plastic surgeons for all the time and that's you know put in fillers or injectables because that's what they've seen on tv ads or friends have had it uh, you know, Botox and other things. So today we're going to really focus on what are fillers and injectables and Botox, what are the differences and what do people come in seeking and uh, be able to kind of guide our patients uh, in terms of getting them really outstanding natural results and, um, you know, uh, be able to have them really achieve what they're coming in for. And that's yeah. what I feel like yeah. a lot of times when people are coming in to see us. Uh, yeah, what's the motivation? What, what's the motivation? It? And the, um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of questions in that question, but I'm going to start with, uh, with one thing. The, um, you know, everybody always sort of feels their best when they, when you look your best, you put on a more confident face, and confidence is the most Everything. attractive thing. And the um, and this was something that was sort of in the purview of very wealthy people who sort of had to look good. When all we had was collagen for 20 years, you could fill a line or a fold. It was extraordinarily expensive. It didn't last very long, and there was no way that it. It just wasn't something that served sort of the mainstream public but now that we have that it's the you know if it, it, it's available to everyone and the and so we're sort of watching what happens when that's available to everyone you know i think about this sometimes at work like if it were the middle ages and you had buck teeth or you were really nearsighted or farsighted you would just be that guy that couldn't see or the one with the weird teeth and that would be your life and now i mean we get that fixed like overnight if somebody walked around with really crooked teeth and never got braces we would think they're nuts 
So why then, if somebody's got a really sort of bumpy, funny looking nose that brings their face out of proportion, or they've got no chin or no, like you can fix it. And then I tell women, especially all of the time, like you can get, you know, five years of therapy to accept the fact that you're flat chested, <laughs> or you could just get a boob job. It's cheaper. It's faster. <laughs> You'll probably be happier, but there's, there's something in, in both of them, you know, getting both, I guess, is the, is the best thing. But with Botox and fillers, I think a great deal of that popularity is that you can, you can do small things that, oh, I don't even know, just small things that, that sort of lift your mood. And that, you know, with aging, one of the things, I, I think one of the biggest drivers that that sends people into an office like ours for aging is that some of the things that physically happen to you uh, make you sort of give off or emote um, things that you don't mean to to give off or emote. So anger, you, yeah, mad, looking tired sad and tired, yeah. 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 And that it the you just get tired of that. Oh, if you were mad, would you tell me? Is something wrong? You getting enough rest? Yeah. It's hard to have a good day when yeah. somebody like even they if you are having you a good day stuff. and they yeah. keep telling you this stuff. And that so if you can spend, you know, a few hundred dollars and take that question out of your life, why would you not yeah. do it? And then there's some interesting um new information on something like Botox that the um they're using Botox in depression now. And the um and at at one point it was thought that maybe if you look in the mirror and you look mad, sad, or tired, that depresses you, and then that becomes True. a feedback loop. But now they 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 think that that's not at all what it is. They think that there's some sort of afferent efferent pathway, like your your brain knows what your face is doing, just like and your face knows what your brain is doing. So it's sort of like your mom said it's as like a kid, a just smile, mechanism. you'll feel better. Yeah, it, that there may be some truth in that. And that so if you, even if you just sort of lift your forehead and hold your brows up, you actually feel a little bit of relief. And sometimes people that come in and get Botox comment on that, that it feels better that their brow's not heavy. Less and, stressful. Yeah, less stressful. They feel stressful. like less stress. Now, what, okay, let's first talk about what is Botox? Okay. And what are fillers? Because okay. a lot of times people come in and they're like, oh my God, I saw this person that got the worst Botox ever. Yeah. And, and the, their and faces are like, have eight gallons of yeah. filler in, in it. Yeah. But so what are the I differences people, yeah, people for our often, audience that kind sure. of isn't? They often think they're the same thing yeah. and they're they're not really. But it the, um, yeah, Botox can, let's see, how in the world, it, that, it, it sort of modulates, um, muscle movement or at least that's what it's used for in the face it uh it 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 keeps you from releasing um sort of a neurotransmitter that does different things in different parts of the body under your arms it makes you sweat but in facial muscles it makes you face it makes you make expressions and the um and the uh, that's very different than volume loss i think if i i don't know i sometimes go back to the uh, I sometimes go back way too far when I describe things. It's very doctory. Like you ask somebody, somebody asks you what time it is, and you have to teach them how to make yeah. a clock. And so, feel free to interrupt <laughs> me if I start doing no, that. No, but, but we want to we want to get into that detail. Like, what do you like? How do you explain when someone comes in that yeah, they, they need fillers? The Why do they need? Yeah. yeah, what's the difference? Yeah. Like, that's, so how I usually explain it to patients is if you think of it as kind of a layered thing. The, the first thing is the craniofacial skeletal support, right? So it looks like a skull at a Halloween party. And that changes in both shape and size as we get older. And that's upholstered with soft tissue. And I tell them the soft tissue, very simplistically put, is like a sandwich of fat, muscle, fat. And then there's this outer elastic envelope of skin that holds it together, kind of like a Spider-Man mask. And then all of it changes. And bone, even though we think of it as a very stable organ Solid. that's sort of yeah it's very it's dynamic not. right it's constantly getting broken down and remade so it changes in both size and shape as we get older and then all of the stuff that it supports slips and slides on that changing pace and then that stuff the the sort of fat muscle fat sandwich that upholsters the bone it changes in its own right too it's and right. so does the skin that wraps around it so the fat at the bottom of that sandwich sort of gives anterior projection to the face and the fat on the top 
kind of gives kind of connects like a jigsaw puzzle so that the topography looks a certain way you want certain areas to reflect light and certain areas to shadow light and we process those shadow patterns very very quickly so if somebody wasn't born with a chin for instance or wasn't born with cheekbones then they need volume and you can use that with chin implants or cheek implants or you can use Fillers. a quote unquote filler cuz filler will replace volume if somebody has beautiful bone structure and these big cheekbones and but they are a yoga teacher and do three classes a day they probably don't have an ounce of fat <laughs> in their face never. and the, i had this one really beautiful woman come in one day and say oh you know doctor that was before my cheekbones worked against yeah. me and it cuz she started looking really really skeletal and the and sometimes it's just the skin if the if you look at Robert Redford like what a great looking guy i don't think he ever wore sunscreen in his whole entire life and his skin was like the the only Leather. thing that aged <laughs> yeah. but to a great great degree yeah. right and then in that fat muscle fat sandwich the muscle all the muscles of facial expression are in there and the um so if you scowl a lot or I, those are some of the things that that botox can help with so botox will just change sort of expressions and sort of the the most common use for it is in the upper face and that just from you know we furrow our brow and that whole area around the brow kind of depresses the the top of the face and then the forehead kind of pulls it up and it's the elevator they're in a tug of war and the um life's hard so the brows always win they're all winning <laughs> they're all and winning the, and that's that's i guess the yeah so like the way i always kind of just like what you just described i think about it and i explain it to patients like okay do you remember how your great grandmother if they lived and you saw them how they look they just were very skeletal they lost all their fat their skin thinned out yeah. their or eyes sockets were like huge and you could see every feature that gaunt look is kind of where our aging process will take us yes you know, yes. if we live long enough and we don't do anything. Yes. And that's kind of where fillers and volume can really help. A lot of people come yeah. in and they're like, oh my God, I want a facelift. I'm like, oh no, 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 no. You like need volume and yeah. it's a whole different process. Yeah. And so, uh, so I think it's kind of cool because now we have so many tools that 20 years ago, honestly, like you said, there was one product out there, it was called Collagen. It would last like maybe a month or two yeah. and people were using it for like these little lines around the face and kind of i feel like you actually and i always tell everyone you revolutionized and i know it was like early on in you know 15 years ago with you know a product that had come out at that time yeah. and we started thinking about volume because you had a lot of uh, experience with patients who had hiv yeah and their face because of the medicines they were taking was really kind of accelerating their aging process yeah, and that, that kind of being such an opportune thing for me and the um I, I i'm not sure that it was revolutionary for the world but it was revolutionary no, for, for aesthetic me. medicine for i aesthetic think it was medicine, yeah yeah it the um th those were the days when some of the meds for um for hiv seemed to be related to lipoatrophy and they would lose fat in some areas of their body especially their face and they would gain fat in other other areas. parts right so it their faces were had lost so much volume and the um and that was you know i don't know 2006 7 8 it right right around the time of the economic downturn <laughs> and I, I think a lot of the surgeons go back into the lab during those economic yeah. downturns and the um so a couple of the doctors rod rorick and yeah. joel pessa at southwestern were doing studies looking at fat and the and whether or not fat was compartmentalized on the face and they used dye and sort of put it north south east and west and look to see if it's sequestered anywhere and found that it did and those were that was the sort of our first appreciation i think that first article came out in 2007 and that was our first appreciation that the volume in the face was compartmentalized the before that we just thought with facelifts that you were lifting one just, big yeah. one big sheet and that those that those compartments of fat seem to um age independently even among one individual and the and that they all had an effect on 
on everything else. And that, that really changed a lot about how we, um, how we approach that volume. And looking at also one of the things I think, like, I'm sure you get this all the time. Oh my God, I had fillers. I don't like it. That whole process was, it's not just what you're injecting. Yeah. It's where it's injected. There's an art to it. There's really an aesthetic art. And one of the things that if you, if for our viewers, if you haven't checked out Dr. Fitzgerald's website, please do so because you will see some of the most beautiful transformations and you just don't know actually what what has been done, but the individual looks really beautiful, natural, aesthetic. And 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 that's like the the eye of where the injection and what type of injection, we'll get into that in a bit and what products to use, really go into that process. Because before it was just like, put fillers in and make people look like pumpkins. Yeah. And that changed with, I think, some of the things that you brought in. I think you're right. I think the surgeons deserve the vast majority of the credit for that because the, and guys that were using a lot of fat and the, you know, um, Sebastian Cotafana, a dermatologist and anatomist, who's very, very good, did this one timeline of everything that, you know, of all the most salient, findings that we've had as we've learned to work on the face, whether that's surgical or non-surgical and, and things are just speeding up, you know, in the old days, if you wanted to see what happened to the skeleton and how it changed as we got older, you had to do something called cephalometrics where you sat with yeah. a, a ruler and a pencil and figured out well, this X-ray. one's this big right. and this yeah. one's this big. And the and now there's, you know, there's CTs and there's computers and there's, you can do 3D imaging. Yeah, 3D and imaging. And then you can send it to your friend in Uzbekistan yeah. at two in the morning from your kitchen table. And it, that things are just accelerating. And, and I mean, he showed that most everything that, that we are using now is come from the recent past. And that, so I tell people a lot when they say they're afraid they're going to look freaky when they get fillers and the, that we're getting better at fillers and that it, it, we did initially do it intuitively, like, like we did with facelifts. Like when we started with facelifts, we were just picking up skin and then we realized, oh, that's not the only thing. Right. So then it's skin and fat and then it's skin, fat and muscle. And now there's some deep plain facelifts with, and it's much better. So I usually tell people, you know, like when you look at Joan Rivers facelift, it the if they'd had a if she'd had a heart attack around the same time that she had a facelift, you know what she would have gotten for treatment? A laxative and an oxygen tent. <laughs> so the cardiologists have come have a long evolved, way. Evolved, right? And so Healthcare have we. has. And that so and then I say, you know, look at Meryl Streep's facelift and everybody's like, Meryl Streep had a facelift? I I, I don't know actually, but I can't imagine that you couldn't look that, that shit, good yeah. at that if you did. She looks amazing. And the um, so I think we just know more about how to do it. So it's science and art, right? Yeah. And I guess the art is that sort of light and shadow and how to how to make that right. But instead of just sort of putting it in the cheek, we have much more sophisticated ways to look at like the we know that the way that the bone changes over time is very predictable but that is very individualized. It the, you know, if you look around a crowded restaurant or a crowded room, like there's no two individuals in there that look exactly alike. Like we all have the same parts and pieces, but they're a little, they're a little smaller, bigger, or put together in their own kind of way. Like that gives us all our individual look. But you see things honestly differently when you're looking at someone's face and We've spent a lot of time, yeah. you know, yeah. with each other at conferences and meetings and injection sessions and your office. And yeah, I really feel like when you're looking at someone, you're seeing something most doctors don't see. I, and I'm being very yeah. honest. This is like not, you know, no, you, I, I mean, I, you're I, seeing I things. How do you, I, I, because what you see is really hard to teach. And that's the art. That's, That's the, the art and yeah, really, and you're, you're, you're a student of this because Dr. Fitzgerald, I mean, we've co-edited books together. And I mean, when you're writing a chapter, you are like delving so deep into learning the background and understanding all the nuances, looking at the previous studies. But when you're seeing a patient, I feel like you're just seeing this three-dimensional changes that they've gone through almost yeah. like in your head. You're like, okay, I know how this person looked 30 years ago and 
I know 30 years ago what flaws they may have had. So yeah. now we're going to not only try to make them look more youthful, but kind of address the little changes that can make them look their best. Yeah. So yeah. how do you do that? Yeah, <laughs> I think that's the thing. And I think that's the, like what people, I, I could talk about that subject all day, but I think that the big obvious things are overdone and done. Um, you know, people you make that their cheeks are too big or their lips are too big or, and people will come in and ask me now, you're not going to give me those lips, are you? Or those cheeks, are you? And the, I mean, the true answer is not yeah. anymore. <laughs> like the first few years, everybody got them, yeah. right? No, absolutely. And the, but I do think that it's, that it's teachable, a lot of it. But that you have to understand it really, really well to teach it. So it's an evolution for both the teacher and the student, right? I think there's some old Hindu saying, I think about, I have a lot to learn and a lot to teach, teach. which is, all true about all I of agree. us, right? And the, so the better that you know something, the more simply you can present it to someone else and help them know it faster. And the less you know it, uh, it, uh, it it's harder to teach. And that, you know, for one thing, I think, um, because we're all a, a little bit crooked, we all have kind of a shorter, fatter side and a longer, skinnier side, and that happens from birth, right? The You the make a brain in a spinal cord early in embryologic development, and it starts as the neural tube, and then on either side of the embryo, it they develop the a little sides, like siblings. Right. Yeah, like siblings, not twins. So you can always look at the shorter, fuller side, and that it's 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 a few years younger, even when you're born. It's but you can see it. You can see it even on babies, even on kids. But you see it much more obviously as we age. And somebody was showing me. Uh, it was Dr. Sabanko was showing me an article a few uh, a few days ago that we can it it has to do with our threshold of um how much we pick up that asymmetry that it it can go to a certain point and we still don't really see it and then one more millimeter and it becomes really really obvious, obvious. and that and you definitely I agree with see that 100 yeah you really see that in people as they age and the, if you go on the internet and just go on google images you can use celebrities or politicians because there's pictures of them you know you can look at Oh, you know, your 30 year Queen Elizabeth pictures, yeah. For, yeah, you can look at huge differences. And then Val Lambros has given us so many great tools to see that change. He started out by taking younger pictures and older pictures and, and comparing them. And then he did it with 3D images and then animated them so you can actually watch the change in progress. And, the, um, and that kind of tells you, so you have a cheat sheet with every, that's what I'm, leaning towards is that it the like what do you see you have a cheat sheet <laughs> look at this side and that side and that one looks better and then see if you can figure out what it is and some of the things i can figure out and i'm sure a ton of them i'm still missing and that's another joel pessa thing when he said you know there are a lot of arbitrary descriptions of youth but youth is not arbitrary it's just very difficult to define <laughs> it Oh my the, God. But you recognize it in a when you see it in a second, yeah. in a second, and that. But it's really, it's hard to recreate. And the um, the other thing I was gonna I was gonna say is that the I think that the motivation for for coming into an office often the underlying common denominator I think that brings everyone in. And this is a sort of an opinion I've come to after years and years of doing this. I think it's all empowerment. And I think at a different time um, in life, what it is that empowers us are different things. Like if uh, in some ways, when you're young, you want dopamine, and when you're older, you want oxytocin, Oxy. right? That's a whole nother subject. But that, 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 we should do a podcast yeah, on we that. we should do a whole dopamine podcast on that. Dopamine versus oxytocin. <laughs> that would be so cool. It really would, wouldn't it? But you want excitement yeah, and when you're fun young. when yeah. you're young, and you want comfort and safety when you're older. and but I think that, um, you know, a 20 year old, like 20 year old girls come in more often than not asking to have their lips injected. So they, they, they don't want big, fake, goofy looking lips. What they really want is their choice of any guy in the room because they're still looking for a partner. Yeah. That's sort of where they are in life. And whereas a new mom comes in and just says, if one more person asks me if I'm getting well, I'm any tired. sleep, yeah. yeah, like just make the bags under my eyes go yeah. away. 
make me look a little, and everything in between, like a 55-year-old guy who just got a tech job that he's wanted forever, and he gets to work, and everybody's 28. Like 20. <laughs> and the, like, he didn't, want, he didn't want to be treated like yesterday's yeah. newspaper. And the and you can take that, you could take that everywhere. Across the board. It, that, yeah, I've had 80-year-old women come in and ask to do cosmetics, and the in in a way that, I don't know, once you're in that demographic, like you're you're seeing familiar names in an obituary. So do you look in the bathroom mirror and see things that make you feel like, oh, you know, I'm, I guess I'm 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 on a countdown. And who wants to do that? So you know, it's so funny because I have you know a lot of uh, women and some men who are in their fifties who come in for a facelift, right? And they're great candidates and we talk about facelifts and we talk about volume and yeah. all of the other things and their main question is do you think i will need another facelift in my life i'm like i you won't be tell. able to tell you because it depends on where you're at how you feel about yourself what you want to do what you want to and what kind and, of like different things age different yeah like everyone born, ages different like if you're born with no chin are you going to need another facelift? Yeah, you're yeah. going to have a turkey neck when you're 35 <laughs> and it's going to come back. And that so but the and so it's different for everybody and that brings up a good point too. The um you know, I teach a lot. And so when you teach the residents, they're scared to touch young good-looking people. So they'll sort of gravitate towards an older demographic and they'll bring in a 70-year-old for their first person oh to Oh my treat. god, yeah, which is like the worst the thing, worst you, thing can do. you can do yeah and that so that's what i tell them now like it the because every different tissue is changing you know the skin the fat the bone the muscle blah 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 if you treat a 35 year old who started to age yesterday you can fix any one of them and just a little bit of it and they all pop right back into place and that by the time you hit you know your 60s and 60s. 70s you have to fix one of each and you have to fix sometimes quite a lot of of each of them they're they're so much harder it takes a lot so, of yeah a lot more a work. lot more work and the so and then some people that you know in somebody who's got just a little volume loss and pretty decent skin it doesn't matter if you facelift them or you know tighten the skin or if you add volume one will compensate for the That's, other but again over time you need a little bit of all of it so but, i think the waiter you you know the longer you wait the harder it is. Absolutely. By the way, side note, Dr. Fitzgerald is the rock star of teachers in dermatology. Oh no, no, I'm serious. Like a, you when know, she, I should no, tell no, the when, audience no, that no, I no, paid when, you when a lot you, of, I paid no, you a lot before we no, started this. Thing when she is stuff. at a conference and you know, there are conferences that uh, there are live demonstrations of injectables and you will see like this packed room of all these like groupies, Dr. Fitzgerald groupies, that you know, those, watching, it changes, watch, it changes. No, it no, changes. no, no. I've seen it, it so changes. many times, and but the, um, so so much but fun the, seeing that. I think that. that that's the thing too, is that that nobody wants to. Just like the patients don't want to come in and leave looking like a freak, the doctors that treat them no, don't want to sure. make them look like a freak. Well, everyone means well. I mean. Yeah. I, I would say 90% yeah, of doctors, exactly. they want to do what's right. Now there's a group of doctors and maybe people, some, some people that humanity. are just, yeah. yeah, they're just not going to be as ethical. They're not going to be as good. They right. may, not, may not have talent. Maybe they have different motivations, yeah. but most people, most of the doctors yeah, do want to so really too. do, do their very wanna best, a, yeah. but they're not going to have your art skills and you're yeah. not going to have your vision skills and they're not going to see your analysis. And that's the difficult thing. You can teach that, but I kind of feel like you can't as much yeah. as maybe just putting the needle in. Yes, you could teach how to, you know, someone for them to put a needle in in the right plane and yeah. inject it. But the analysis, the three dimensional analysis yeah. is really hard to teach. And I, you know, it makes me think about, you know, when I do microsurgery, yeah. right? There are doctors that I train that they just, when they go under a microscope, because we have to go under a mic, they just don't have the three-dimensional uh, feel of the tissue. Yeah. And it's the same thing with the analysis of what you're, yeah, no one's gonna ever see exactly what you're seeing, but 
you know, you didn't, someone needs to have that skill set of understanding and analyzing and so forth. So yeah. that's where I think, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, you know, fillers, Botox as a commodity where like, oh, okay, I, I'm just going to oh. go, I'm just going to go have it done here. Oh, yeah. You because of things, but it. there's yeah, the saw, arts part of it is I really where, where it comes in. I saw something on Instagram yesterday with a picture of, uh, on the, on one side was Mona Lisa and on the other side was like a kindergarten drawing. Oh, okay. And it was like, oh yeah, it's a lot cheaper. It's a lot cheaper here. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> gotta that, send yeah, that to So that's, it's a medium. I guess yeah. that's the. Yeah, the, it is. The, it's, the, yeah. it's art. It's truly it's sort of art. It's like TV. There's yeah. lots of different things on TV. Yeah. There's lots of different things. That, and and there the is, quality yeah. is different, right? Yeah, yeah. So now I want to kind of get into a little bit of the, bit of the nitty gritty of, let's talk about the most common areas okay. that you use fillers, because we talked about the anatomy and the aging process okay. and so forth and the beauty and the motivations and what the different classes of injectables are and what you like using in the different areas. So yeah. I'll start you off with an area that I think has been, you know, 20 years ago when someone came in saying, I have tired eyes, yeah, under eyes, that was like, oh, you know, let's these, do a blood let's do a eyelid lift or yeah. blepharoplasty. And for the lower eyes, I feel like those results were just like for the average individual, not Good. that great not surgically. Not. No, surgically, and they cause a lot of issues. Now our technique has evolved, and I think the results are really, really great. But now for many of those patients, I feel like fillers, like do a tremendous amount of improvement for certain types of uh, certain types of patients. So why don't we start with like the eyes? Okay. And then maybe you could share with us some of the other areas and what products you like to sure. use and what they each do. Sure. So do you think that with surgical technique, you were saying that the techniques have evolved. Would you say that one of the biggest evolutions in that technique is adding volume from fat? Volume preservation and restoration, especially around the eyes. So that instead is, of taking that fat out and throwing it in the trash can, you're moving it. Moving it, it repositioning it, it repo redistributing it, okay. adding to it because we understand like under eye and the mid face, the cheek area, yeah. they're they're interrelated. Very much. And so you could have someone that has mm -hmm. eyelid issues, but a bigger problem is their cheek volume. And by just adding volume to the cheek, their eyes look better. Yeah. So like, you know, using like I, if someone's going into surgery, I like to use fat, their own fat. Yeah. As one of my tools of volume, giving volume. Yeah. So fat kind of is kind of a filler anyway. essentially. Yeah. And then you don't and have getting to buy it is really easy. You know, and, buy the CC yeah. out, of a, out of a cabinet. And then yeah. they can do fillers too, but not only preserving the fat compartments, yeah. and not taking so much fat and skin out, yeah. but really redistributing, adding fat to certain areas or adding fillers to certain areas. That really, I think, has revolutionized eyelid. And you see yeah. eyelid results, eyelid surgery results, so much better now. So much than better. Ever, like 20 years ago, everyone looked so gaunt and together, different. So they work together, right? Yeah. yeah. It the, it the, what, what came up non-surgically helped us understand Huge. that surgically, you could get better results by doing it a certain way. And that I think under eyes, I think there's a tendency for everybody to think that all under eye, quote unquote, under eye bags are the same thing. And of course they're not. Yeah. I mean, the, some people have herniated fat under their eyes and really, really empty cheeks. And some people just have very, very big hollow orbits and the, um, and, and still have, plenty of fat in their cheeks and the and also the color of the skin changes under the eyelid mm. there's sebaceous glands in the skin that give your skin its color so you've got that kind of rosy flesh color along your cheeks and then we don't have those glands under our eyes and in some people there's a very sharp cutoff between where you have glands and where you don't and so you can see normal colored skin and then this really sort of clear skin right above it and in that clear skin, you can, if there's a lot of fat under it, then that gives it the same flesh color. But if there's not, 
all you see is dark veins and muscle under it, and you look like a raccoon. Yeah. And that, and if you put filler under and that, and it's one of the one of the honestly one of the most difficult things, and one of the things that bothers people the most. Yeah. 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 And it's very hard to fix. Yeah. Very hard to fix. And that, but if you give enough support to the cheeks underneath it, it'll stretch it out a little tighter. And the um and that keeps it from shadowing as much light, and that that helps it, that helps it a bit. But the um but so you have to look at you know whatever it is in that person that's missing that that's making that uh, that's making that look funny. Like sometimes even in somebody with bags under their eyes, if they've lost a little cheek fat, just putting that cheek fat in will camouflage it, and you don't they don't you don't even see it anymore. And the um and you're right that like supporting the cheek and the bony stuff around the cheek that sometimes alone will help more than anything. And I think it's just because of light and shadow and and that everything is um so magnified. The topography of the face is so incredibly magnified by light and shadow. And that's how you can get away with you can fix things with actually a. a Pretty conservative amount of of stuff, whether it's fat or filler, if um if you can if you can change that light and shadow pattern. So in somebody like I was saying earlier, if you have somebody who just started aging, someone in their in their who hasn't who's still got pretty good skin integrity, who's got decent bone structure, who hasn't you know lost a lot of fat, then you can you can fix that in a non surgical way with a little bit of skin tightening or a little bit of filler, at some point using a lot of filler becomes enormously expensive. And the um, and it might be a lot more um, economical and a lot less trouble over the long haul to just go in and tighten the skin with a facelift and use fat as a filler so that you're not- Or less volume of fillers. Yeah. And the um, so it the and there are there are people that um, are very amenable to talking to a surgeon and doing something that's going to last a very long time right off the bat. And then there's a significant number of people that have to kind of like work up to that. Yeah. yeah. So they'll some people will be like, no, I'm never getting surgery. I'm never getting surgery. And others will come in and do filler for a few years. And the first time they do it, they're super excited because they see a lot of change. And it's just very it's it's I don't even know what word to use. It the uh, it just it makes you kind of feel like you turned back time a little bit. Yeah. And the um and the anyway, it's very gratifying. And the and it is very empowering. And the and even then, as much as they love it, sometimes three or four years in, they're like, "So, you know, somebody who could do something yeah. that could last longer." <laughs> I mean, there are certain so they issues really work that together. Just, yeah, yeah, there are certain issues that I think just becomes very, very difficult to fix with just adding volume, even if you're like a master injector. Yeah. And so those are situations that. You know, you need to lift tissue and reposition tissue, and there's like huge herniation of the buccal fat pad and jowls and, you know, small chins. And so you start, you know, laxity, significant amount of laxity in the neck or the muscles. And I, f I find that a lot of times, and this is something I think you're also really good at, of like really giving your patients, like, look, your best outcome is going to be surgery, and then we can use a little bit of fillers yeah. or fat and do this and that, rather than keep kind of injecting and injecting and injecting. And then you end up having, you know, patients who aren't satisfied yeah. with their doctors because yeah. they're not achieving what they want, which is they, they want to look great and they want to look good and they want to have confidence and they want to be See, empowered and so forth. And you've got to be really honest with